Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Rizwan Nirani. Um, I'm a practicing radiation oncologist. I have a primary focus on uh, GU radiation oncology, uh, longtime um, uh, spacer user uh, over the last 10 to 12 years. And um, uh, my practice is primarily in California, Northern California, uh, Southern California as well, um, really focusing on um, you know, finding ways to reduce toxicity uh, within uh, prostate cancer treatments. Thanks, Riz. So my name is Dr. Zach Clausen. I am a urologic oncologist at the Augusta University and Georgia Cancer Center in Augusta, Georgia. And uh, I've been spacing for about a year and a half now, probably about 50-50. The first half was space OAR. And then in October of 2022, completely flipped to, uh, to Barogel. And so I've been using the uh, the product for about nine months. And so my practice is um, very much uh, prostate cancer heavy, uh, all aspects of prostate cancer, but certainly um, having a focus on on localized prostate cancer and and certainly reducing toxicity with bear gel. And so today, Dr. Narani and I are going to go through sort of a casual conversation of some of our experiences and sort of the yin and the yang of the radiation oncologist and the urologic oncologist. And this, this product really is an intersection of both specialties. So we're looking forward to, uh, to our discussion today. You know, Zach, we, we met uh, several months ago at yeah. AUA. And, and I think that was uh, kind of uh, an impetus for this event, right? Because uh, we both come from very different practices. We come from different specialties. We come from different parts of the country. Uh, but but I felt a great uh, commonality when I was talking to you uh, yeah. because I think we we, we share um, a, a, a strong interest in trying to figure out rectal toxicity and uh, seeing how we can further reduce the burden uh, that our patients face, um, you know, after radiotherapy, especially. Yeah. No, and I think too, Dr. Ronnie, I think in your practice. As a radiation oncologist, you're seeing these patients pre-treatment, during treatment, post-treatment. And as a urologist, and even as a urologic oncologist, when we when we send these patients to you until recently, it's sort of, you know, we're we're sending them off and then you guys treat them. You know, we'll see them back, sort of interspersed PSA follow-ups with them and with you guys. And to to sort of have Bear Gel come into the picture over the last year or so, and and certainly since uh, the FDA approval and and the and the um, the publication of the trial in JAMA Oncology, which we'll go through today a little bit, in February of 2023, you know the urologists are you know we're having to not re not educate ourselves but re-educate ourselves in terms of what some of this acute and long-term toxicity may be and how we can reduce it as you mentioned. I, I think it's kind of interesting, you know, within our practices, right? Yeah. Uh, for 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 the longest time, it was almost like. If you look at the three primary toxicities from any prostate cancer treatment, right? So it's uh, urinary toxicity, erectile uh, function or dysfunction. Those, I feel like, because there's so many things that you can do for that, right? right. That it, it almost seemed like it's what we focused on because there were, there were things we could do. And when it came to the third toxicity, which is GI toxicity, it almost became like we weren't really sure... Should I be managing it? You know, are you comfortable as a, uh, a a urologist managing it? And what often happened was, it it, it was almost kind of like somewhat minimized because we had to send it out. We had to send it out to a different specialist to take care of it. And I almost felt like this the sense of frustration that uh, if you look at it from uh, uh, how do we make the patient's quality of life better. That we always ended up kind of treating GI toxicity as its own little thing that we weren't really addressing as readily. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, if you look at the data, I mean, it's not uncommon. I mean, 10 to 38% of patients will have some degree of rectal toxicity and some degree of, of dis disabling rectal toxicity. And so you're right. I mean, as a urologist, we're used to overactive bladder, we're used to radiation cystitis, we're used to erectile dysfunction, but this this sort of off to the side, as you say, orphan uh, side effect <laughs> right. has, has sort of um, been not pushed aside, but kind of minimized to a degree. 
And certainly with uh, with Bear Joe, we've been able to to significantly reduce it as we've seen in the in the recent data and we'll go over. A lot of my colleagues, especially in radiation oncology, it's kind of surprising. I, I don't hear this from urologists. I, I, in fact, I don't think I've ever heard it from a urologist. But a lot of my colleagues will tell me, I don't really know if there is sufficient radiation to, uh, GI toxicity in my practice right. uh, to justify doing something in addition. And m most red onks will uh, see the patient for first one to two years and then uh, stop seeing them and you guys do the long-term follow-up. So wh what's your perspective in terms of how prevalent in your practice will you see long-term GI toxicity in these patients? You know, I think, I think from a toxicity standpoint in general, certainly the overactive bladder is most common and we see those patients and we, we treat them medically. Uh, we know that over time, you know, as a, as a surgeon, we, we create immediate erectile dysfunction and then it slowly, hopefully builds back up. Um, we see sort of a slow fade with, with erectile function with, with radiation. And some guys do just fine. Some have that slow fade. There's usually not that drastic drop off, but getting to the GI toxicity, I think the acute is probably more cumbersome than even than the long-term from a urology standpoint. And it's usually kind of mixed into that conversation of, Hey, how are you doing? And They'll say, well, I've got some overactive bladder. It's doing okay with oxybutynin or merbetric. Um, you know, the erectile function's okay. May, may, maybe we should try daily Cialis or or, or on-demand Cialis or Viagra. But usually once they get out of that first six to 12 months, you know, that rectal toxicity, at least from a urology perspective, is not as devastating maybe as some of the other, you know, ED or, or OAB. But certainly we see it in those first three, six to 12 months. So, so when, when, when we look, you know, within radiation, there's, there's, as you know, there's, there's two phases, as you were mentioning, uh, to GI toxicity. So there's a GI toxicity that we'll see, um, you know, in the first three to four months, depending on um, uh, what kind of radiation, external radiation or uh, brachytherapy, what kind of radiation we use. And we call that acute radiation toxicity. By definition, we've used six months or less as being defined as acute radiation toxicity. And then there's a long-term radiation toxicity that doesn't really have a, an endpoint. Uh, but from, from when you look at the data, most of it uh, that you see acutely will go away, right? So if you were trying to figure out, oh, how do I make the toxicity look more? How do I make the toxicity look less? Uh, you can pick your windows, right? right? And if you use a spot like, oh, I'm gonna say, how many patients have toxicity on three month follow-up or six month follow-up, at that single time point, it's gonna look very low, right? Because, you know, as you know, the toxicity comes and goes, it can be intermittent, it can be there for a certain amount of time and then it resolves. And in most patients, the acute toxicity will resolve at six months. Right. What's interesting is that when we look at the data, and there's really strong data to show this, that one of the biggest predictors of long-term toxicity is the presence of short-term toxicity. Right. And, and long-term toxicity will accumulate over time. And it's, I think, in many ways underrepresented and um uh, ends up because it's present for a longer period of time, ends up having a much greater impact on the patient's quality of life. Yeah, absolutely. When, when you look at, you know, the whole radiation, com uh, radiation oncology community, right? Um, we, we have spent so much effort on, uh, uh, so many different ways to reduce the likelihood of radiation toxicity, right? But, but at the end of the day, when we look at the data, we always see rectal toxicity. So from, from a urological perspective, what, what, what's your perspective in terms of, you know, what comes next? Yeah, great question, Dr. Ronnie. I think if you look at the radiation data and what the, from a patient perspective, they want cancer control, they want convenience, so less visits. You know, if I take somebody's prostate, it's a one-day visit, they stay overnight versus, you know, going back for several weeks. So control of the cancer, um, convenience to the patient, but also you know, decreasing toxicity. And from a very high level sort of uh, Neanderthal surgical view, you know, can we do something between the prostate, the rectum to move the move the rectum out of the way or move the prostate out of the way, depending which way you look at it. So maybe you can walk our listeners through some of that early data that uh, that subsequently 
was re evolving around um, decreasing that toxicity with with rectal spacing. Yeah, and 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 it kind of was deceptively simple, right? We were over technology usage in trying to really parse. You know, when when you when you look at the simple fact, you have uh, your prostate typically a millimeter away, posterior to the prostate. Uh, you have the major uh, dose, you know, constraining organ, which is the rectum, right? And um, uh, it seemed it seems simple now. It wasn't at that point, but when the uh, first spacer product came out, polyethylene glycol, um, you know, it was really the first time that in a more commercial setting uh, that we started testing uh, moving that that rectum away from the target. And, and it's, it, you know, these radiation technologies work great, right? So even when you uh, move it from a millimeter to 10 millimeters, which was uh, what the goal was with the um, uh, polyethylene glycol uh, pivotal trial, uh, that's a log difference. That's a huge sure. amount of space for a radiation oncologist to work with. Uh, so if you look at the space or pivotal trial, it was a really well done trial. It was a prospective randomized patient blinded uh, trial where uh, both groups got a procedure, uh, which in this case was a fiducial. And then the uh, experimental group also uh, had the addition of the uh, polyethylene glycol spacer placed. And uh, the results of the trial uh, showed that if you looked at the dose that we know, is that it's associated with rectal bleeding, right? Uh, the so-called rectal wall dose, and the dose is 90% of the prescription dose. So in the spacer trial, it, it was uh, the volume of the rectal wall getting 70 gray. Uh, we saw a statistical uh, reduction in the dose to the rectal wall. So one of the endpoints was met. But what was interesting was that uh, the second endpoint, which was um, was there reduced grade two toxicity? And the second uh, predetermined endpoint was not met on that trial. So uh, that was a that was a great start in terms of proving the concept that re, uh, re, uh, increasing the space will reduce uh, toxicity to some level. But it also brought up this, um, you know, immediately became clear that uh, this is a first generation product. Right. And, um, you know, what are the things that we need to do to move forward? So I think Dr. Naran, as you said, this, the space or trial had had efficacy data, but certainly there was some sa some safety concerns, which we'll walk through in this trial. And I'll also kind of roll through some of the uh, the aspects of the Barrage gel pivotal trial, which was published in February of uh, 2023 in JAMA Oncology. So this is a nice slide, side by side comparison between the two trials. Space or is on the right. Barrel trials on the left, as you talked about, uh, space or was conformal radiation, seventy nine point two gray and forty four fractions, whereas the Barrel trial was hypofractionated, sixty gray and twenty fractions. And basically, study design was essentially the same. There was a randomized two to one to the intervention, the rectal spacer versus the control. Uh, two hundred and one patients in the Barrel trial and two hundred and twenty two in the space or trial. Some slight variations in inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, and as we go down to the, the second part of that table, the effectiveness endpoint was uh, was was a little bit different. So in the space or trial, more than 70% of patients receiving a greater than 25% reduction in, in 70 gray to the rectum in the space or trial compared to 54 gray in the Barrage trial. As you can see, both of these studies did meet their primary endpoint, 98.5% of patients had this reduction in the bear gel trial compared to 97.3 in the uh, space or trial. But among patients that um, that met the primary endpoint, there was more in the bear gel trial compared to the space or trial, 85% versus 73.3%. Now, what we talked about in terms of this grade one versus grade two toxicity, we do see, and this is going back to your conversation of the CHIP trial, this, this zero to three months is really a key time point for these patients. So the Barrage trial noted grade two uh, or higher GI toxicity improvement at zero to three months, which is that time frame we're worried about, versus the space or trial, which noticed grade one or higher 
uh, from three to five months, which is a little bit more of that that sort of tailor, tailing off in the in the the time frame where the patients may have issues. So when we look at safety endpoints, the bear gel trial certainly hit exactly where those patients are having issues with a higher metric of grade two toxicity compared to three to 15 months with grade one toxicity in the um, in the space or trial. And so we can see that uh, grade two toxicity was measured in this bear gel trial. It did have an improvement where it was not measured in the space or trial. And in terms of long-term toxicity, uh, we did see improvement in both trials. But getting to uh, several of the points we're going to get into a little bit more in detail is this issue of rectal wall infiltration. So only one in the bear gel trial and nine in the uh, space or trial. And uh, you can see differences in symmetry, uh, certainly uh, much more symmetrical with, with, uh, with bear gel and more than 95% compared to only a coin flips chance in the space or trial. So Let's talk a little bit about rectal wall infiltration because there has been some new data coming out even recently at the AUA in uh, 2023 in Chicago, uh, looking at sort of a, a real world evidence aspect of uh, space or classic. So Dr. Narani, maybe we can walk through the important uh, aspects and take home points from, from rectal wall infiltration, both in the trial setting, but also in the real world setting. Right, so as you know, when, when we're doing these trials, the question is always when, uh, you know, you do uh, the procedure within this really highly formalized uh, study setting, how does it transfer to uh, the general community, right, once it's um, FDA approved and widely used? And the, the signal we saw on uh, the SPACER trial was that uh, we had uh, nine patients or 6% of the SPACER patients who uh, were noted to have rectal wall infiltration at uh, the time of the mandated MRI that was done as a part of the treatment planning process for the radiation. Um, these patients weren't uh, particularly symptomatic, um, and so we, we basically proceeded with the treatment, and there did not seem to be any apparent um, uh, complications associated with rectal wall infiltration, or, or in the few patients, we didn't really see anything. What, what became interesting is that um, uh, after FDA approval and you know the obtaining the CPT code and widespread use of initially polyethylene glycol, radiation oncologists, when they were doing their treatment planning, uh, were finding a large number of rectal wall infiltrations. And the question was, how do you deal with these rectal wall infiltrations? And it, it was kind of this building wave of more and more anecdotal uh, reports. And then, you know, as you and I uh, saw it at this year's AUA, uh, we started seeing a little bit of a, a more formalized reporting of what the community experience is. So within this Australian data, the Nepean data, uh, they looked at um, uh, th their patients who had MRIs, and they found this very alarming rate of um, rectal wall infiltrations. And I and I know you, you know, you were present at the meeting. Um, what, what was your sense of what, what this, you know, maybe you could kind of walk us through, what did this Australian data really kind of show us and how, how do we put this in context of what we're seeing on the trial side? What it tells us from a, from a real world evidence experience, and, and as you mentioned, the, the, the trials are going to be at centers of, of excellence, essentially. And, and so what we're seeing is, you know, one in three patients had a rectal wall infiltration, which, as you mentioned, they may not all be symptomatic. But if you look at the bottom of the screen, that there's a, a, a non insignificant number of patients who had significant uh, clinical issues with this rectal wall infiltration. And so, as you can see from the data at the bottom, grade three infiltration associated with higher risk of rectal toxicity, not too surprising. But we see that four of these patients had significant rectal complications you know, grade two rectal ulcers, rectal urethral fistulas, severe constipation, delaying radiation. And so what it tells me, especially from a, from a urology standpoint, is that one, rectal wall infiltration may not be a big issue, but it, it could be a big issue in some of these patients. And for a procedure that should be relatively benign, you know, these are, these are devastating complications. And so right. for them to not only report their, their, numbers that they see on the MRI, you know, from a radiological standpoint, but also to have the patient follow up and the patient um, complications is, 
is certainly you know sparked a lot of interest at the meeting and and something that uh you know um is 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 a major patient uh safety concern for sure this is kind of the tip of the iceberg of um very brave uh very commendable yes. uh reports um uh I, I mean this is a great service to our community that these people are reporting their data as they are Right. Uh, but but we're seeing these reports that one are retrospective, right? And um, it, it's not going to fully represent the extent of the toxicity. And and what was concerning to me was that uh, you are seeing, you know, meaningful. So if you look at the so-called grade two or grade three rectal wall infiltration, we're talking about serious infiltration events, right? Yep. Uh, you're seeing it and there is nothing necessarily on the immediate clinical symptom side that can tip you off that these rectal wall infiltrations have happened. So not all those patients were symptomatic, right. but we know that you know three, six months later after they've been radiated, uh, that they can uh, show up with very serious complications, right? So, so, so to me it was, if you're gonna do any kind of polyethylene glycol spacing, you have to, as a part of your uh, treatment planning process, you have to do an MRI because the CT is not going to be adequate for finding all the rectal wall infiltrations, and you need to address it with the patient ahead of time before adding any further treatment like radiation that could potentially, and we don't know this to be true, but that could potentially impact the likelihood of healing from that rectal wall infiltration. Absolutely. You know, I, I guess I'm representing my fellow community radiation oncologists over here. Uh, we're frustrated by uh, these events that we're seeing when it comes to treatment planning, uh, potential rectal wall infiltration, potential asymmetry of the spacing. And, um, you know, if I kind of, how, how do you think we should address this? And frankly, how do you think we have addressed it? Because we now have. Yeah, no, I think. It all goes back in my mind from a from just not even a urologist standpoint, just from a clinician standpoint. We're trying to reduce toxicity of a treatment, and if that intervention is causing significant toxicity, there's a huge disconnect between what our end goals are, right? So if we if we look at the current slide and and what some of the historic issues have been, I think I think as you mentioned, we've now addressed that with uh, with Baragel, and so historically, you know the 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 space or product requires a hydro dissection. To confirm needle placement and if you get that hydro dissection the first time that space is nice but oftentimes it's multiple injections which is, which is distorting the view on ultrasound so if you inject two three four times maybe that fourth time you seem like you're in the right spot but it's actually into the rectal wall you can't tell that in real time with a hydro dissection the other issue and this may have even more of a ramification on on a clinical uh, or or, or a, a significant rectal wall infiltration is this peg insertion under high pressure dynamics. And I think that combined with a single step continuous injection under pressure, a time constraint anywhere from 10 to 14 seconds, whether you're using the classic or the view, if you're not in the right spot and you're injecting under pressure with a with a peg product and that and that sits in the rectal wall, you, you're probably not going to know, as you mentioned, this may not manifest right off the bat at the time of the procedure, but then you subsequently radiate that tissue over the course of the next several weeks. And this is where we're probably seeing some of these issues, which we saw in the real world evidence from Australia uh, presented at AUA. And so the other issue is that when you, when you have committed to your location and you're injecting under pressure, this is fixing in space. So there's no modification. There's no, there's no touch up. You're committed to wherever this is going to go. And whether this is going into the rectal wall, whether this is following the path of least resistance after multiple hydro dissections to the right or the left, leading to some of the asymmetry that we touched on briefly, you're not getting the coverage that you anticipate for your ultimate uh, protection from, from, from toxicity. And I think on the final point on this slide is, you know, there's poor visualization. It, it, if, if you've got multiple hydro dissections and you're injecting this peg, the peg does not lift or provide immediate feedback under ultrasound guidance. And so you may, you know, you may say, all right, here we go. And you inject it and you may see it kind of go off to one side. You have no idea whether it's in the rectal wall. 
the the sort of the the positive feedback at the time of the procedure is just not there and you're you're kind of in a holding pattern until you get your your planning ct or mri at that point in time as you mentioned the 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 conclusion of this abstract at aua was that everybody should be getting mris and so that's a a very strong but applicable statement for people that are are planning to use space oar i think that's a nice lead in into into what the benefits of bear gel are and that's you know you'll go through this but control real time right. uh, just the setup everything is just so much more convenient so why don't you walk our our, our listeners through through why bear gel really hits all of these points and makes it better and safer yeah so so you know when when we kind of came up with you know what's our wish list for uh the next generation that's going to improve you know where we started right and to me the first was that the nature or the consistency of what we're injecting should be the same from the point of being in the needle to uh, or in the syringe in terms of what passes through the needle and what's what ends up in the patient, right? So we need that consistency in terms of the pressure dynamics of what we're placing. Uh, the second, and really for me, was one of the most key things is that I should have the ability to continue seeing that space right. as we're developing it and uh, not lose any visualization so I can adjust what is happening to sculpt it or to uh, conform it to that particular patient's anatomy. But more importantly, we, we know that the anatomy opens up in very different ways. So to be able to see if it's opening up in an asymmetric way or if it's opening up in a way that you know needs further uh, adjustment. So to be able to continue to see it was, was key for me. Uh, and then um, I really like not being under a time pressure, right? It's really hard to make decisions in 10 seconds uh, or less, right? And the, the key with this is there is no polymerization, right? And you could take two minutes, three minutes. Um, you rarely need more than that. Uh, but you can do a very dedicated approach. You can make adjustments to your needle position. Uh, you can build up uh, the spacing uh, through the different parts of the prostate. So it's customized to that particular patient. You can adjust to asymmetry and uh, do this in a way that, uh, frankly, is, you know, I, I enjoy doing it. It's fun to do uh, because it's like a little, uh, you know, uh, puzzle that you figure out and, and, and you get to completely customize it to, you know, the, the particular patient's space. Uh, but the, the question I have is, when you have somebody who hasn't done this before, who isn't used to transperineal ultrasound, transperineal approach, how what is it like to kind of bring them up to speed and to be able to take advantage of all these different uh, opportunities we have with barrier job? Yeah, I think the biggest one, and you mentioned it, is the lack of the time constraint. You know, when you're teaching space OIR, you 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 let them put the needle in, you maybe check it yourself just to just to hopefully confirm you're in the right spot, and then it's that. 12 seconds of, of crossing your fingers and your toes to hoping that it goes in the right spot. But with, right. with the bear gel teaching my residents is, is just, it, it's so much easier because you can let them put the fiducial markers in. It gives them a little bit of a, a little bit of a flavor for the transperineal approach. And then you, you guide them, help them guide the needle in and, uh, and get the placement, check it in the sagittal and the axial view, make sure there's no rectal tenting. And then you kind of let them go. You let them do that first CC injection and and just like we talked about for that first one from base to apex in the midline get the lateral sides on the second one and then touch it up on the third one you can see several pictures here so at the top is is dr lambert is one of my senior residents doing his first one and you can see in the top right he's got a nice space and you can't see the symmetry there but i uh, trust me it was symmetrical uh bottom right is one of my incoming chief residents doing his second one i believe and then who i call my resident liaison at the bottom left is dr klein he's done about 15 or 20 with me and and he's uh, he's almost ready to start teaching the course at this point. So he's, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, the the learning curve is is very is very short. Um, and because of those things you mentioned, the control, the lack of time, the safety aspect, um, we've been able to to teach. You know, I've got thirteen residents. I think at least ten of ten of them have done at least one, and some of them, like Dr. Klein in the bottom left, are are, are almost basically an expert at it at this point. So. Um, it's it, it translates to teaching, and for anybody out there listening who's thinking about doing it in practice, this is a very short learning curve because of the the the, the aspects of safety and 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 time that we have. 
So Dr. Narani, thank you so much for this discussion. Um, and hopefully uh, the radiation oncologist and the urologist on the line have found it useful.